Are you having a hard time figuring out what to get dad for Father's Day? You should check out Row One Brand's Vintage Pictorum Gallery. They have America's best sports art. With over 7,200 historic sports prints, you're assured to find something unique for dad this Father's Day. Instead of a boring old tie, get him a historic baseball photo taken by Henry High Sandum at the historic Polo Ground Stadium in New York City during the 1894 Temple Cup. Or, if he's an NFL buff, check out the 1963 vintage NFL poster. These are so good looking that you'll be amazed how they turn out. Shop now at sportshistorynetwork.com slash row one and save 15% off your order. If you haven't heard about Anchor, it's the easiest way to make a podcast. Let me tell you all about it. First of all, it's free. There are creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you so you can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. You can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make a podcast, all in one place. So download the free Anchor app now, or go to anchor.fm to get started. Thanks for listening to the Pigskin Tales podcast. This story was written and produced by your host, Ross Bliley. Edited by Nikki Bliley. You can follow me on social media outlets such as Facebook and Twitter. Subscribe to the show today through Spotify, Podchaser, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, CastBox.fm, Pocket Casts, Breaker, and Radio Public. If you like what you hear and want to support my work, go to Anchor.fm. On the World Wide Web at RossBliley.com is where all my episodes are uploaded. The soundtrack is provided by Kevin McLeod of filmmusic.io. Thanks for your support, and I always appreciate feedback. Last time on the Pigskin Tales podcast, I told you that Mr. Nevers was a coach at the college and professional levels. He also enlisted in the military at the age of 40 and served as a captain, getting promoted to major. This time on the Pigskin Tales podcast, I'm going to tell you how the story ends. The big dog led an amazing and interesting life. Even though he was so busy that it hardly seemed like he had any time to have a family, he still had three children. One of them actually blazed their own path into legendary status for motorcycle jumping. I can't tell you that story now, but just know that his own story in the motorcycle jumping world is considered legendary. Thanks for listening to the Pigskin Tales podcast. Part 10, The Chicago Rockets. For the next year, former Marine Corps Major Ernie Nevers worked for a large trucking company in Chicago while he was waiting for his new football team to start practicing for the upcoming NFL season. Dick Hanley and John Keeshan began recruiting players for the Chicago Rockets during this time. According to the 2009 online publication Coffin Corner, Volume 31, Issue Number 1, from ProFootballResearchers.org, the All-America Football Conference procured, persuaded, and pilfered 109 players away from the National Football League. The Bears and Cardinals each lost 12 men. Bob Dove was one of 17 players from Hanley's El Toro military football team that signed with the Rockets. President Keishan was able to persuade him to sign a three-year contract worth $5,250 per season, plus an additional $500 raise every season. Another recruit, Crazy Legs Hirsch, was given a $6,000 contract and a $1,000 signing bonus by Keishan. Six months later, it was reported that Hirsch had a personality and contract clash with Keishan, but Keishan quickly shut down the drama. When asked about the reports, he said, When I say a player is signed, he is signed. And I say that Hirsch will be with us next year. Hirsch didn't see it that way. 
The season kicked off in September of 1946, and the Rockets played their first five games at their home stadium known as Soldier Field. According to the Coffin Corner publication, the opening day attendance was 51,962 screaming fans. By the third game of the season, some major drama happened between Hanley and Keishan. In an article written in the Honolulu Advertiser on October 29, 1946, Rockets President Keishan released a statement to the press saying that his player coaching experiment was finished and that Pat Bolin was the new head coach. Ernie Nevers was going to be the new running backs coach instead of assistant coach. Wait, what? According to the Coffin Corner, just before kickoff of the third game, Keishan announced that three players would be coaching the team instead of Hanley. Those three players would be Bob Dove, Willie Wilkin, and Ned Matthews. Hanley became upset and went to go sit on the bench with his assistants, Nevers and Boland. Nevers and Boland then just sat there looking at each other surprised by the announcement and did not say a word. At halftime, Keishan told the press that Hanley has repeatedly submitted a resignation for several weeks, and on the last occasion, I accepted it. Hanley came out and said that he was fired, and he told Keishan that, If you think you can get someone else to do the job better, go ahead. It was only natural then that Nevers thought that he was going to be fired too, but he wasn't. He and Bolin were inactive as coaches while Dove, Wilkin, and Matthews ran the team. By Halloween 1946, President Keishan decided that he needed to end his three-player coaching experiment. He named Pat Bolin, former All-American at Minnesota, as the new head coach of the Chicago Rockets for the last two games of the season. Nevers became the running backs coach. In an interview, Nevers told the press that All the drama that unfolded with Hanley all came out of the blue. Supposedly, Keishan took a secret poll of the players and 32 to 1, they all voted Hanley out as head coach, saying that the type of offense he implemented was too complicated for what they were doing. After the season, Nevers decided to retire from football for good. Part 11, Life After Football While working for Keishan and Hanley in Chicago, Mr. Nevers met a beautiful woman named Marge. Part of her story is from a newspaper clipping from the Chicago Tribune on April 24, 1937. It was reported that Marge Luxem was granted a divorce from John Railton, who owned B.A. Railton Company, a wholesale grocer, the day before. The article didn't say why she wanted a divorce, only that her charges of cruelty were not contested. I think she wanted a divorce because she hated being an in-store mannequin. Sure, all the guys liked looking at her and she made 25 bucks a week, but she just wanted a better life. Judge John Liu ordered Mr. Railton to pay her $500 in alimony for four years, but if she got married to someone else within four years, she would only get half the money. The judge also ordered Mr. Railton to pay the monthly rent of $195 for a year for the house on Astor Street that Mrs. Railton was able to keep along with everything in it. The article said it was worth $13,500. Plus, she got to keep her mink coat, which was worth at $4,000, and all her jewelry valued at $9,000. By the time it was all over, Mr. Railton had to not only pay for the rent of the house for a year, but he had to pay her for pain and suffering and all the legal fees of her lawyer, which was two grand. I could then assume that for the next 10 years, Marge Luxem was just living the single life off the divorce settlement. According to a column written by Alan Ward published by the Oakland Tribune on July 23, 1950, Marge told the sports editor the story of how she and a companion were talking about who Ernie Nevers was. 
It's nice to meet you, Mrs. Nevers. Likewise. As I said on the phone the other day, I'm Alan Ward, the sports editor of the Tribune. I heard a story from a friend of mine that you didn't know who Ernie Nevers was before you went out on a date with him. Please, tell me the story of how you got to know Mr. Ernie Nevers, who became the biggest name in NFL record books. Well, to tell you the truth, I never had been much of a sports fan. I've always been so busy with my own career and being married and traveling that I didn't have time to listen to sports on the radio. It just so happened that I was visiting with a really good friend of mine the day after I was introduced to Ernie, and I mentioned my date. The previous evening was a man named Nevers. My friend was like, Ernie Nevers? And I said, well, of course. Do you know him? She was so shocked I had never heard of him. At first, I had no clue. Then I thought for a few moments. Now, the name Nevers did have a familiar sound. Then I had it. I told my friend Brightly, of course I know who he is now. The football guy. Certainly I've heard about him. He's been on the radio. They always say, tinker to Nevers to chance. I was so embarrassed. Since then, I've learned so much about sports in the last few years. Ernie's been really good for that. Really? You had no idea that the man you went out on a date with was famous? Oh no. He was a regular good looking guy. It was only later that I found out he was famous. That's a very interesting tale, Mrs. Nevers. I appreciate you taking the time to visit with me. My pleasure. On February 1st of 1947, it was reported in the Tribune that Ernie and Marge wed in Chicago at her sister's place. The article does mention that Nevers expects to go out west and work as a sales rep for an Evanston candy company during the Chicago Rockets offseason. And since this was the second marriage for both, there was neither a reception nor big media attention, only a circuit judge performing a quick ceremony. After retiring from football, Ernie became a public relations representative for a wine association. After about a year, he and Marge got married. It was reported by the Petaluma Agnes Courier that Mrs. Nevers gave birth to a baby girl, May 26, 1948. In July of 1950, the Nevers couple created a local television program in which Ernie discusses sports with his wife. Chicago Tribune sports editor Alan Ward mentioned it in his On Second Thought column. It was broadcast on KGO-TV in San Francisco. By 1954, they had become so popular, they created a TV series and titled it Out on a Limb with Ernie Nevers. The program had a lot of sponsors including R&M Style Shops, a sophisticated dress shop in which Marge would wear their clothing on the show. For the next 20 years, Ernie would host his TV show as well as do promotional appearances. Part 12, Death of a Gridiron Star Life after professional football for Ernie Nevers was much more fun. He started a family, got a real job, and hosted a TV show. Marge and Ernie lived in Strawberry, California for a short time, then moved to Tiberian, a three-hour road trip to the east of Strawberry. Multiple news articles cite conflicting information on how Nevers passed away. Some say a heart condition, some say a kidney disease. In my opinion, I would go with a heart condition because that's a very common way of passing away so sudden. Ernest Alonzo Nevers was laid to rest on May 3, 1976. He was 73 years old. Ernie was considered the greatest athlete to come out of the West. He was Jim Thorpe's protege, according to Pop Warner, but he was overall much better than Thorpe. He was also considered the greatest 60-minute man in NFL history, but I'll leave that up to you to decide. Thanks for listening to the Pigskin Tales podcast. This story was written and produced by your host, Ross Bliley edited by Nikki Bliley. You can follow me on social media outlets such as Facebook and Twitter. Subscribe to the show today through Spotify, Podchaser, Apple Podcasts, CastBox.fm, 
Pocket Casts, Breaker, and Radio Public. If you like what you hear and want to support my work, go to anchor.fm. On the World Wide Web at rossbliley.com is where all my episodes are uploaded. The soundtrack is provided by Kevin McLeod of filmmusic.io. Thanks for your support, and I always appreciate feedback. Sources of information were found on the web at newspapers.com. 1900 to 1909 Prices and Wages by Decade from the Library Guide at the University of Missouri, ProFootballHallOfFame.com, YouTube, History.com, the Online Encyclopedia Britannica, the National Football Foundation, BaseballReference.com, ProFootballReference.com, and ProFootballResearchers.org. I also want to thank CC, a recent supporter, for reaching out to me and sharing my work. At the Sports History Network, we're all about sports yesteryear, and so we're so pleased to introduce you to Row One, an online memorabilia gallery and shop that brings your sports history to life anywhere. The Row One Gallery includes over 5,200 gorgeously reproduced prints of team posters, game program covers, game tickets, advertisements, and more in baseball, pro and college football, pro and college basketball, and more. And any gallery item may be printed in a variety of sizes on wood, metal, canvas, acrylic, or poster paper. And in Row One Shop, check out the thousands more of unique Unique items with a retro and historical designs dating back to 1876, including t-shirts, long sleeve shirts, phone cases, mugs, blankets, pillows, towels, and even shower curtains. Go to sportshistorynetwork.com, R-O-W number one, for access to the full Row 1 catalog and for gallery prints and gift items, plus get a 15% discount off all prints on the Row 1 Pictorum Gallery with coupon code SHN15. Follow the link on the show notes.